Well, today we are going to talk about one of the mysteries of eternity. Problem that all, every human being has faced and must face in the course of his existence. And it is interesting to realize that there are a number of remarkable interpretations of this phenomenon, which we call death. So in many cases, the idea has been that the afterlife was simply an extension of physical existence into an invisible realm. This was the idea of the Chinese emperor who had clay copies of his court made in life-size figures standing in rows to serve him in the afterlife. Now, he did not believe that those concrete figures were going to serve him, but he believed in a spiritual mystery involved, that after he passed into the other world, these concrete and stone figures would be living, that they would be alive and full size and would serve him, and that he was merely moving his court from the visible to the invisible side of life. Now in Egypt, the similar practice was also followed, but with more symbolism involved. The uh, afterlife of the Egyptian, the Elysian fields, or the plains of Amentet, were a beautiful facsimile of Egypt. The same grounds of the same beautiful river the wonderful people, the palaces, the temples, and all the makeup of a tremendous metropolitan Egyptian uh, super city. At that time also, the pharaoh was buried and other nobles with similar uh, expositions. He was buried with miniature figures of all of his retinue, his court and all of the valuable things that he needed to continue his life in the tomb. The afterlife of the Egyptian was in an underworld, ruled over by the great deity Osiris. And this great deity, judging the quick and the dead, ruled over a wonderful realm beneath the earth that men could not see but to which human beings passed after the physical decease. In some of the old manuscripts, various animals, such as family pets, were included among the figures that came with him into the afterlife. Everywhere we find evidences of the belief that the invisible world to which we pass and from which we came has a more or less physical appearance that it is similar to the world that we know. It was not until comparatively late in the development of human thinking that the idea of heaven and hell as we think of it today came into existence. Most of antiquity had really no concept of hell. They did not have any of that Dante-esque uh, mystery that we find in the beautiful but morbid paintings of Gustave Doré. To the ancient people, uh, hell was uh, more or less of a shadow. They did not believe they were bad enough to deserve it in the first place, and they were perfectly willing to face a world that went on into a realm beyond ours. The Greeks, for many centuries, believed that there was no afterlife except in the ghost world. The, the ghosts of the dead continued forever. This did not meet with the approval of minds such as Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle, and modification began at a comparatively early date. Among the Egyptians and Phoenicians, the invisible world was so visible and so real that you continued in your various pursuits as you had lived them in life. If you had plowed a field while alive, you would have a field to plow in the afterlife. And there is one story about a very honest moneylender 
who had never cheated those who borrowed from him. He was a very good man. So when he died, they gave him a special privilege in the afterlife. He could set up his money tables by the gates of heaven and lend money to anyone coming in who wanted it. <laughs> and he always was meticulous and honest. And it was the honesty, and not his profession, that earned him this respect. Then we have another group of people who believe, as many primitive people do, including a number on the Western Hemisphere, that death is a birth, a birth into the afterlife. And many ancient peoples buried the dead in embryo position so that the earth became the womb of the second birth. We find tombs of this kind on all the continents. We also have evidences that many of those who uh, lived before us, at least, had a consciousness of being able to travel in the afterlife while they still lived. This is true of the American Indians of the Southwest. It was also true of the Irish. The Irish perfectly believed that certain of their sages and saints could go into the afterlife and that they would be welcomed there and they could bring back messages for those who needed guidance or assistance. It was not until comparatively late that the death took on the terrible appearance with which we have associated with. It was not regarded by the ancients as a misfortune. It was regarded as a simple transference of conditions. The individual did not change greatly by the transition, but he functioned in a different dimension of life. And here he had to grow and learn and grow up again and go to school in some way to, to learn his way around this new realm. Now, psychics in all parts of the world have given us traditions about this. Andrew Jackson Davis, the seer of Poughkeepsie, one of America's most prominent early spiritualists, gave what he called a picture, the summer land. Uh, this summer land was a beautiful countryside. And it was an invisible pasture field with flowers and trees where individuals lived out a very beautiful life if they had earned such a record. If they had made some mistakes and so forth, they received some punishments, but ultimately were accepted into the world of eternal light, eternal sun and summer, eternal happiness. So this was one psychic belief, and he wrote the book, The Stellar Key to the Summer Land. Another psychic of great fame was Baron Emanuel Swedenborg, who was one of the greatest scientists of the Scandinavian countries. He was also in his later years a psychic and had many beliefs concerning the conditions of the afterlife. He left very detailed accounts of conditions beyond the grave, which very well resembled conditions in a well-run Swedish state. And among other things, in Swedenborg's viewpoint, any young ladies who happened to arrive in this afterworld were chaperoned <laughs> to make sure that everything retained its proper proprieties. Now we have constantly had psychics who have something to say about this type of thing, but have been strangely uncertain themselves. We very seldom have a psychic exposition in which the emphasis is how things are over there. We hear about famous people coming back to converse with the living, but it does not seem that any answers that they give clear the problem of life after death. The uh, answers accept the problem, but they do not clear the path or the way or the circumstances involved in the transition. This seems to have been generally neglected throughout almost all psychic uh, experiences. Jacob Bermy, the German mystic, had visions of the afterlife. His visions of this were very much based upon the visions of Dionysus Areopagus the early Christian father. These uh, dreams and visions represented a luminous universe 
with hierarchies representing the planets and the zodiacs. In this luminous world of the world of light, of color, vibration, and was a very pleasant place. But what you do when you get there, Bami didn't tell us. All he expressed was the fact that it was a vision, a vision of things to be, such as the visions of the Gnostics and the uh, Albigensians and the Manicheans and many others. Each religion of the world has its own concept of paradise, where it is and what it is. There seems to be very little, however, detailed study of the subject. Now, let's go back to our own problem here. Supposing we assume for a moment at least that this world that we live in now can be considered as a basic example of something, an example that it is hard to deny, an example which might tell us a lot if we consider it carefully. We know that life here begins with pain, begins with trouble. The most existence that we have here passes through stages of troubles and infirmities. That it only lasts for a certain length of time, and then in one way or another we depart. But there are a lot of things to think about in this. Why is this world, which was given to us according to scripture as a garden, why did it get to be so troubled? Why is this planet that presumably was invented, devised, or created for the purpose of allowing or enabling human souls to grow? Why has it been in trouble since the very beginning? Why has this growth consisted principally of war and crime? Why does everyone who comes into this world apparently uh, come into a sphere of sickness, disease, sorrow, and death? Is this part of a plan, or is this something that shouldn't be but got to be from other causes? Let us assume for a moment that the person living in this world is living in a highly conditioned condition, which he has probably, in one way or another, caused for himself. In other, wor in other words, it was not intended that birth should be a problem of great pain, that the growing up and living through the various intensities of life would be an endless cause of suffering and mental anguish, or that a sickness would do dominate the careers of many, and that very often both birth and death were painful experiences. Is this due to the fact that such was nature's intent? Or is it due to the fact that humanity, in one way or another, has tried to take over nature? has tried to rule nature rather than obey it, has tried to create its own laws, and has set up a human autocracy in the midst of a divine one. It seems as though there is much to indicate that the troubles that we have are mostly not the result of the way nature put things together, but the way that we have readjusted and dodged, dodged them from one condition to another. We have juggled these factors, and we have mixed them up so badly that we have ended up with crime and war. Suppose, for example, the human being had not made these mistakes. Supposing he had obeyed the laws of life as they were given to him and revealed again and again through his sacred writings and the wisdom of his sages. We would say the human being was born in peace and in co and consolation that there was no back heredity, there were no deformities, there was no hereditary sickness, disease, emotional incompatibilities, broken homes, from which the individual had to come. Suppose that was eliminated. The result would be a very different type of person, a person not necessarily wise, but a person endowed with the natural gift of the world in which he lived. He would be endowed with the simple fact that he could exist, that he could exist happily and comfortably, and for the most part, in good health. Now, most of our problems probably arise basically from bad health. We become to toxic or di disturbed emotionally. We gain all kinds of problems which we assemble and struggle with. 
And we find that this span of 60, 70, 80, 90 years to which we pass is largely a confusion caused by ourselves. And two aspects of that confusion that come into focus with us at the moment are, due to this confusion, birth is painful. And due to this same condition, death is painful. Now, it's not necessarily true that that was what was intended, that that is what we have done about it. We have taken natural laws and so misused them, distorted them, and ignored them, that we have brought down upon ourselves a mass of troubles which were not necessary and which were not intended by nature. Nature did not intend man to come into a world of miseries, suffer, and depart in pain. These conditions are due to human action and thought. We are now fighting in our communities a whole series of such problems. We are fighting narcotics addiction, alcoholism, tobacco addiction. We are fighting all kinds of laws and rules relating to wealth, power, and uh, ambition. We have set all of our goals on the physical plane of life. We have taken this world, which might have been a very happy playground, and turned it into an infirmary and a vast graveyard. This is not what nature intended. This is not what man was put together for. This is not the experience he was supposed to be ready to receive. It was assumed that he would come to this world to gradually come to glorify the Creator and the creation. Instead of that, he has come in the end to damn them both. So we have here a, a false beginning. And with a false beginning, we also have to go back a ways. Because this false winning is of the sins of the fathers under the fifth and sixth generation. We are all here with infirmities that have come from the misdeeds of our ancestors. And these we carefully pass on to our descendants. And the result is that health is, an, is an, um, almost imaginary. But we are beginning to realize more of its importance. And in the last 50 years, we have done more thinking about health, probably, than any time in history. We may almost say that primitive mankind didn't think about it because it didn't do anything to hurt itself, primarily. It lived a very simple life. It had to defend itself against the uh, terrors of the night and things of this nature. But for the most part, it lived a very simple existence. As we came to be more and more complicated, we became sicker and sicker. We gradually also then developed institutions to correct these sicknesses that we had created. But because we created them within ourselves and not in the body, the position is not always successful. We are not able to cure the sins of the spirits with pills and shots. The entire part of the individual that is important to us at the moment is that which we can't see. It is the invisible over-self that really runs the, the uh, physical body. This over-self, however, is so neglected by most people that the body is without adequate leadership. It is as though a very nice government were set up with a proper representative, and in the course of time, a bunch of gangsters took it over. <laughs> and these gangsters are our selfishness and our deceits and our stupidity and our rejection of common sense. All these together have ruined what might have been a pretty good place to live. Now, we're gradually beginning to be a little more aware of this. It is dawning upon us that it's possible that all these misfortunes are not necessary, that they were not in the original archetype, but have been the result of vicious misinterpretation or distortion of the common facts of, of good nature and common sense. So we say to ourselves, suppose we clean this up. We might then have a world in which the human being would be decently born, with comparatively little pain to the parents, a world in which they would grow up gradually, and education would be suitable and adequate to their needs, 
and not to try to adjust them to a hopeless situation. We are educated more or less to try and lengthen our survival in a situation that never should have existed in the first place. A true education, a true realization of our real purpose and our real potential hasn't a chance. It wouldn't even be mentioned because it would interfere with some monopoly that is flourishing, for the moment at least. So we have no way of, at, at the moment, correcting some of these problems. But they are correctable. They should never have existed. And they represent a very mis vicious misuse of an inheritance which came from the highest possible source, truth. So we go along through the years and we get sick. And we get tired. And we get tempted. And one by one we fall under some form uh, of disease or displeasure which begins to corrupt our natures. And so the body, which probably has a potential strength of at least close to a century, may give out any pair along the line because simply it does not have the strength with which it was intended to be endowed. Now this doesn't mean that every person in trouble has lived a riotous life. But behind every person may be several generations of the lawless. And many a proud family now, which is also in trouble, it has among its ancestors two or three that were hung from the yard arm. They were actually pirates of the worst. So we have bring with us a body which is more or less a, a, a not a blessed gift in the beginning, the way it is now, though the best can be done under the circumstances. But this body comes in with a great many deficiencies that are due uh, to the ancestral pattern and the whole line of the descent of humanity. Uh, human, the human generation regeneration problem has been going on for ages. And we are now well along in a platform of misunderstandings and ignorance. So we come here with what we have. And being not too well, we begin to look over the situation to see if we can find something to do about it. So we get a little uh, help from some new kinds of people that come up who are beginning to teach the, the importance of nature in, in remedying the defects of human beings. We begin to think of exercise and diet and living a little cleaner life and refraining from some of the noxious and toxic uh, situations that are now gaining fame and distinction. But the moment we try to improve, we hit, we hit upon some pattern where someone is making uh, a good profit by our not improving, and then we have difficulties again. In other words, to become honest is desperately dangerous. It becomes a, an interference with the rights of other people to do to us anything they feel like doing, which may or may not be particularly constructive. So on we go, and we learn a little as we go along, and we try to improve life, but we come gradually towards the end of the endurance of a body that has been seriously misused. At that time, there is a whole group of terminal illnesses with which we are combating. We are trying desperately to find cures for them, but are not, we don't even dare to suspect that we might find a cause of them that could be corrected. So in the course of time, we come to the end, and we come to the time where there must be a division between the physical body and the metaphysical elements of the personality. We believe in, in, in idealistic philosophy and in the higher realms of thinking that the physical body is a kind of carriage, a wagon, in which something rides that the actual being in the body is not identical with it. If you believe them to be identical, you are a materialist. If you do not believe that they are identical, you are an idealist. And 90% of humanity has been idealistic since the dawn of time. Very few peoples have ever come to maturity who believed that the individual died at the grave. Nearly everyone has had some philosophy of survival. And without this philosophy of survival, there seems to be no incentives to rise above the misfortunes of the present state. 
In other words, if you if you're miserable here, but you do the best you can, perhaps somewhere else you're going to get a better chance. Many nations have also gradually developed the concept of reincarnation as an answer to the in, infinite problem pattern of growth. It is perfectly obvious that the average person in one body as we see them now in, in incarnation cannot be perfect. We can be know definitely that we cannot know everything. We cannot be everything. We, certainly we try to have everything, but very few make it. What we really are is growing creatures in a midstream of life. We came from something less and we're growing into something better. And this growth obviously is not completed in one life. The individual who makes a modest gain must be considered a success. Those who ignore the whole thing can be rather much failures. So not being able to be perfect now, the doctrine of reincarnation comes in and is probably now accepted by something like a third of the population of the earth. It is believed because it is the most reasonable answer to a long-range plan in nature. It is also the only uh, description or the only solution that rewards sincerity and helps the individual to outgrow his own weaknesses and infirmities. If reincarnation is a truth, then comes another question, which is related to the original one. If this is true, where is the being when it is not incarnate? Uh, the uh, Oriental peoples take the ground that incarnations are abnormally and honorably about 1,000 years apart. Under certain conditions, these figures can be modified and changed, and in cases of very advanced persons, the time is shorter. This is because they are more needed here to do the things that there are not too many available to accomplish. But if we have the reincarnation, where is the individual between incarnations? There have been discussions of these, the, the toys, and someone says they may be in Devakan or someplace in, in the heavenly world, or according to Ptolemy, up somewhere in the zodiac. But these are very faint and uncertain indications. See, there does not seem to be any real map of the life cycle other than a diagram of, and words. The experiences involved seem to be very hard to trace and most uh, even students of the subject have not been successful in creating a, a vivid or living image of the situation. So we have to wonder a little bit about what is the other side of this coin. Where and what are the invisible parts of nature? Uh, Flood, the Rosicrucian mystic, and several others have uh, speculated carefully upon this, and they have followed the idea or viewpoint that man is composed of a series of bodies, that he is not just a physical body, nor is he just a physical body and, and a spirit. He is not a physical body and a ghost. He is a compound creature constructed internally for, to function in more than one dimension of space. We have one dimension here which we function with. But even when we're functioning here, there is evidence every day that there is something more than function occurring within us. The individual is more than a body. He is also more than a body and a mechanism. He is not a robot. He is more than a more than a mechanism because he is a body with an emotional nature. He can love, he can hope, he can dream, he can have religion, he can do all kinds of emotional things which are not natural to body, nor essential to energy, but are essential to the functions that the human being possesses. Then beyond that there is another pattern, and that is mind, the mental life of the person. His mind is not his body. You can dissect him in any way you want to, but you're never going to find the mind. You can find the brain, but not the mind. The brain has to be alive, and the mind has to be incarnate in that brain, or there is no mentality. 
But man has mentality. He can think. He has emotions. He can love. He has vitality. He can win at the Olympic Games. And he has physical establishment, which we call the body, which he keeps in the house and tends to work every day. These different things are part of man. They make together a person. And these four parts are all more or less uh, vehicles, instruments to be used by something, to do something. Now the mind is not a divine thing. It is simply a dimension of existence necessary to thinking. But thinking is not the highest faculty of man. There are all other kinds of higher faculties. And most of all, this whole chain of bodies, like beads, this chain is strung of many beads upon a single thread, as Emerson tells us, and that this thread he calls the over-self or the soul. Now the soul seems to be the master of the mystery. The soul seems to be that thing in man which does not limit him to any of the dimensions of his physical sensory perceptions. The soul permits him to hope and to dream. It permits, it permits him to in, in soul thinking, and soul living, in soul emotion. Without this ensouling, these various faculties are sterile. And this is one problem that we have, where humanity spends all its time working with the bodies and forgets the soul we have a group of sterile organisms and organizations which have no vitality, no reason for existence, hope, ideals, and the greater ennobler emotions of religion and personal consciousness are all part of something above the mind. And this the ancients like to call the soul, which was the master of the entire cycle of human growth. Now, the soul, as Emerson tells us, is a part of divine nature. It is part of something that ensouls all things, so that we can say without exaggeration that the world is itself a soul from which a body is suspended, that this body contains of several levels of uh, management, and various creatures have different degrees of levels. There are some creatures, like plants, who have only the growth dimension. There are others, like animals, who have the emotional development. And there's finally man, who has the mental development. But this is added to the others, making him a composite being with four levels of availability. Now, when he gets ready to be educated or think about trying to do something in life, he should realize that he has these four different levels through which he can manifest. Now, he isn't his mind, nor his body. It is an inhabitant. It is a leaser. He can't own the body, but it can lease it for life. It cannot possess anything, but it can use whatever it wills to accumulate honorably. Thus, we have the individual who at a certain time in this pattern is going to depart from this world. Now he's going to be depart in a series of stages or steps. And this is shown in some of the mystical alchemical diagrams. Uh, the death cycle therefore begins with the discarding of the physical body. And this physical body departs from all of the extremities of the body and finally centers in the heart. From the heart, it carries upward along the pneumogastric nerve until it reaches the crown of the head. And at the crown of the head, it departs. And it takes with it, for a time, a magnetic connection between the super self or the real self and the body, a cord which ties them together. This is a, an umbilical cord for the afterlife, just as it was necessary to have it for the child before birth, so afterwards this cord connects the entity with the body, so that if shock or something of a special nature, suspended animation, 
should occur, death would not follow unless the cord breaks. And this is the cord that is broken at the cistern in the, in the Bible. But anyway, this cord ties the being to the body. When this is broken, the being is in the land of energies. It is, it's in its next body, superior to the physical one. Here it is in a world of energies. In these energies, also, it passes through a series of experiences. The, the vital or energy body resembles very closely the physical and is therefore subject to all the rules that govern physical body, but invisibly. After a certain length of time in which the consciousness uh, extracts from the body the records of an embodiment in order to estimate growth and uh, to guide in the larger directive of the complete composite, this body of shadows or uh, vital energies is discarded also. And it does not disintegrate immediately any more than the physical body. The only way it can be disintegrated in the physical body is through cremation or something of that nature. Otherwise, it must slowly de decline by decay. The same happens in connection with the energy body. It does not disappear immediately or vanish and fade away. It passes through a kind of death in which it becomes an empty body, a shell from which the soul or the higher nature has departed. This, this becomes what is known in psychic phenomena as the ghost. This is the part that lingers until it slowly fades away, sometime appear over a period of many years, but it is no longer the person. The person is long gone. The person in the meantime has gone into the emotional sphere of itself, the aura of its field, and here it is having another series of complete experiences. For in each case, the entity passes through a process of birth, growth, <laughs> maturity, and decline. And in each case, its cycle of life is determined by what it has learned from the lower vehicles or brought down from the higher ones. Gradually, therefore, the entity goes upward through these different worlds, which are often referred to by the ancients as heavens and hells. And hell being missed nothing more or less than to inherit an etheric or vital body that was no better than the physical one when you were in it. In other words, the physical body was infirm because of abuse. The etheric double is, in, uh, is infirm because of abuse or neglect. And in these experiences, the individual passes through rewards and punishments, which however are not eternal, they are not in the form of great damnations, but like the experiences of material life are the results of things done and things undone, and which through which the entity has to gradually grow, extract the essence, and build this into what is called the soul. So all the experiences of an embodiment are precious, they are preserved, they are protected, and they continue. And here also we have the basis of the Akashic records and the records of actions and the records of other times and the records of our planet itself are all preserved in these various strata. Then but gradually the individual dies out or fades out of the emotional life. In each case, except the physical, it is a going to sleep. And Hamlet, you know, in the soliloquy, Hamlet says, is referring to this, that in sleep what dreams may come, and in the sleep of death what dreams may come. This is a very good key that has been generally overlooked. So after that we go up to finally the mental, the mind. And here we have the coordinator who takes everything, or which takes everything, that has been learned and digested and assimilated and builds it into the full record of an embodiment. In this embodiment, the record is a conscious one from below up, the passing from the body out upwards to the higher vehicles is a conscious experience. The descent of the entity from the mental down to the physical is usually experienced in a condition of sleep or unconsciousness. 
from which the being awakens at the time of birth or shortly before that. Now we know that the birth physically has been preceded by a whole series of previous experiences which do not record as far as the physical world is concerned. But some and many of these experiences may be available to an entity before physical birth. They may be they are available as factors in the development and consciousness of the entity. So we have, instead of heaven and hell, we have a life cycle. A cycle that goes on to one, uh, to one grade after another until finally it fulfills itself. In other words, a life. We say a lifetime. A lifetime is really a, is a word applicable to the whole cycle. A lifetime is the length of time it takes to pass from the state of unembodiment down to embodiment and back again to unembodiment. This is one lifetime. And this is the period of time in which the alchemy of the transmutation of experience is consistently and continuously going on. And it is this that makes our entire pattern of life real and valuable. Now we also know that there are other factors that come in. We know that in physical life we dream. And we know that dreams sometimes are very strange things. Dreams sometimes become complete lifetimes. And in many cases, you dream of things that could not possibly occur physically. In one quiet night, we can dream of a terrible storm in the ocean or a fire that is consuming air, a whole mountain. We have all kinds of personal experiences of fear and fate, and death and life, all in dreams. And these dreams represent a certain amount of karmic dissension within the nature of the person. These dreams are all symbolical of something. They are symbolical of lessons to be learned, things to be understood, things to be worked with, rather than merely something to awaken from and hope and glad that it's over. So all these factors are involved in the problem of the other worlds or the, or the possible uh, understanding of the true life cycle. It begins, however, as a lesson right here. We cannot expect everyone uh, to study this whole pattern and put it together from the dozens and hundreds of records of antiquity in which practically every step of this has been explored by sages and psychics and mystics long before this world as we know it came into being even. But we can hope that some uh, understanding of it will help us. Now let's get practical for a moment. This all sounds very theoretical, I know. But let's see what it is to be practical. Here we are on a fairly comfortable planet, fairly nice environment, surrounded by mystery. Now according to theology, when we die, we will, be, uh, we will either go to heaven or we will go to hell. Well, on that basis, our problems are, not, are rather complicated and our, our probabilities are not awfully good. Uh, we are very apt to find that we don't really deserve salvation. We haven't done anything to deserve it while we were here. The other situation lies in the fact that if we haven't done something right, right that we will go to perdition forever and ever and ever, which is also a very uncomfortable thought. But strangely enough, it had very seldom prevented crime. <laughs> no matter how much perdition lies ahead, and some of the old artists showed souls roasting in furnaces for a hundred million years, that particular cult from going out and picking someone's pocket or killing someone he didn't like. All of these terrible things that were going to happen have never prevented crime. They have never really slowed it down much. But a great deal of crime has been committed in the name of these things, as though man had a right to, to actually execute perdition upon his own associates. So as long as this wasn't the way it seemed to be intended, we gradually outgrew the idea of eternal salvation and eternal damnation. 
It just didn't, didn't seem to fit into any kind of a plan. It didn't. It did not make any contribution to the progress of things. If it had been intended that man be created perfect, it could certainly be assumed that this could be accomplished by any power great enough to create the cosmos. If we were to be perfected, there would be certainly built-in factors by which we could receive the inevitable impulses which a deity could bestow. Rather, we were sort of shipwrecked on an island and left to do the best we could. But the reason for that was also obvious. If we did achieve, we achieved ourselves and not by dependence on something else. Growth was a personal experience of unfoldment. And if somebody tries to grow for us, they grow, but we do not. So the whole problem of the uh, beginnings and endings of these things could not be solved by the mere theological concept of eternal uh, punishment or eternal reward. This being left out of the pattern, we come to the point made by Socrates in connection with wisdom. When he finally took the hemlock for refusing to pay a small fine, which his own disciples offered to pay for him, but this fine he considered unjust, and he would rather die than be a victim of, the, of scattering to injustice. So, before he died, he said to his disciples, I'm going out now, and I'm going on a journey, and it's fine. I, I'm perfectly happy about it. I, one of two things are going to happen to me. Either I'm going to cease forever. There will be no Socrates. There never will be anything. Nothing that I've ever done will, re, will be remembered by me. The only things that will remember are those that come after me and read or study. I cease. On the other hand, there's another alternative. Maybe I do not cease. If I do not cease, then I will become again part of that invisible world which I have sought to explore all my life. I will do be a part of that eternal immortality in which I will learn as I have never learned before. I will know the wise and the good, and I will come to the answer of all the questions that I have ever asked. And uh, Socrates then took the poison and died peacefully, convinced of the fact that he was going forth to the answering of questions and not going forth to an annihilation. He was going to continue the path of growth that goes on and on and on. But each step of it, a dramatic adventure, if we accept it in that way. So that, that brings into focus this problem of just exactly what and how uh, we are going to consider the interludes between this life and the next. Perhaps the truth of the matter is very simple, that it will be a period of sleep that we will sleep between lives as we have slept between days in this world. But while we are sleeping, the powers that be will be working in us and with us. But the powers will be working <clears throat> without our interference, which will enable them to work. Whereas in our night sleep, our, our dreams are all influenced by our psychological conditionings. So we'll have a chance for that type of thing a quietude between lives, a Zen sort of situation in which we will become so completely relaxed that we can see truth for the first time. Truth can only come in a state of peace. It can only come as a condition of reward or fulfillment. No one can demand truth. No one can sell it. No one can buy it. But we can all earn it. And we earn it by gradually eliminating the interferences. We take out of our lives the things that are not so. We take out of our lives the uh, patterns and situations which have no meaning. We also take out the irritations, uh, the fears, the doubts, the exaltations and the humiliations, and allow a complete quietude to rest upon the spirit. Now, the word soul is something that also comes into this pattern. And the word soul it, it was used in antiquity largely 
to represent a, a combination of enrichment of the spiritual strength of life with the rewards of incarnation. The soul is the wedding garment of St. Paul on the book of Apocalypse. It is the vesture of experience. It is all that we learn becoming the great ornamentation of ourselves. It is the gradual acceptance and within our own consciousness of the quite one piece garment without seam. The uh, soul is the result of the cycle of incarnations. Embodiment builds soul, for soul is the truth behind each thing that happens to us. And as that thing that happens to us comes to be recorded in our eternal records, it becomes a dimension of soul power, soul strength, soul insight. And in that way, it's very important to us. Now, uh, the soul can also be destroyed or injured by the misuse of faculties and powers, the perversion of mystical experiences, the misuse of the divine power becomes the deadly sin. And it is perfectly possible, therefore, for the Bible to say in uh, one of its thoughts, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. The spirit cannot be destroyed, it is incorruptible. The soul can be a false pattern of living, which falls apart. When it does so, this, con this composite of uh, mistakes can die, because it consists only of false factors. But with, when it is fallen or died, the spirit, which is its real life and its eternal fact, goes on to a new pattern of experiences. There is no end to the spirit. For the soul is the golden wedding garment in which we are supposed to attend the marriage of the Lamb. All these things are told philosophically and mystically in the book of Apocalypse or the Revelation of John. Now when we get to this point in our problem then, we come now back to the day, right now, when we have to keep on living. The concept is very simple, that these bodies that we have have been seen by psychics, mystics, and clairvoyants and have been referred to as auras or magnetic fields. Now each of these magnetic fields has a color and each of these fields is by nature and substance of a beautiful color. But wherever the distortion and perversions arise, the colors change. And out of this also has emerged a method of treating the sickness by spectrochrome therapy, by the use of color. But color, clear, is a soul-building power, and in a sense is a dimension of the soul structure. But soul corrupted is a dismal thing, a faint or unpleasant color. Uh, obviously uh, evil or distorted in one way or another. A corrupted habit of one kind or another. Supposing we have anger. We will say that anger arises for a bound basis from a martial energy. It, uh, in the ancient a combination of astrology and uh, esoteric therapy, uh, Mars was the symbol of energy. Now, if this energy is used constructively, you have a bright, clear red. If it is used destructively, as in striking a blow, or in a nation, is used as war, this right energy is tarnished into a deep, muddy red uh, that is obviously a hideous and unpleasant color. Now, this color is with the person who has had a temper fit or who has had a grudge, or has done something wrong, this color is not only in the magnetic field, but it is also a rate of vibration that can affect health, it can influence the mind, unfortunately, it can devitalize the tissues, it can shorten the life. Wherever the magnetic fields, with their alchemical colors, 
are corrupted by human action. They distort function. They destroy vitality. They impair health and very often become the cause of chronic and incurable ailments. The uh, individual with a bad emotion will ultimately have a sickness to match it. The sickness and the emotion will go together and perhaps cause the life of that individual to cease. And in the afterlife, when it reaches the level of the emotional nature, that color will assert its karma as a factor in character. In other words, that misuse of power is something we have to live through afterwards when we come back or on our way out of this embodiment. Wherever we have store up poisons in the magnetic field through the misuse or perversion of facts and truths, we get this danger of going through the Kamalopas, as the Tibetans call them. Those are the after-death experiences in which we have to cleanse ourselves from the various mistakes with which we have discolored the psychic fabric. All these things can be worked together into a system of thought. We don't need to tell what it is or how we got it. But we can start in early life and with people to recognize the great pattern of health is the individual learning to use his entire organism and abuse no part of it. If that goes on, gradually the entire complication of life ceases. Little by little, the problems solve themselves. That may will not be immediate. We probably have too much karma hanging over from some other past time that we have to clear up. But ultimately, the individual who becomes constructively integrated will recover from the evils from which he has suffered. It will affect his re-embodiment, the circumstances and conditions of a new environment, it will protect his present environment, and it will create strong, constructive bonds between the individual and the society to which he belongs. There's no answer, therefore, to the after-death state except to deserve what might be termed a, a paradisical or peaceful afterlife. In other words, what we should do is drift pleasantly on a great stream of life, through the cycles of recapitulation until we come down again into re-embodiment. If there was no wrong in us on the ascent or on the, in the cycle, there would be no pain. There would be no suffering. And we would find growth and fulfillment to everything that we really want. So while we probably can't change all these things all at once, we can start in by kind of picking up little things that we might not want to face later. If we, if we, we think if we don't face them here, they're gone. But this is optimism. The mistakes we don't face here, we will have to face there. We have to face ourselves. We have to support that which is right, and we have to cast off that which is wrong. And this is true also of the dope peddler and the dope taker, the alcoholic, the immoral individual. Everything that is basically wrong, we will have to face. And the ancients, realizing that we have to face these things, caricatured them into monsters, demons, evil spirits, and filled an invisible world with malignant ghosts. But these ghosts are only unfinished business. The things that shouldn't have been in the first place, but were, and having become, have to be eliminated by the experiences of consciousness. The individual has to correct his own mistakes, either here or hereafter. And this constitutes the cycle of a lifetime, of which only one small part is lived in the visible world. But it is in the visible world that independent action takes place. In the invisible world, there is no new experience added. The experience of this cycle, which is the cycle of humanity, which has its physical foundation in the visible earth, this, the, the experiences of growth are here. 
That which is out there is the soul growth, is the incorporation of the right into eternal value and the gradual correction of that which is not right. But all new opportunity for growth is conferred here. And from here, the consequences go on. So it is the way we accept growth that determines whether we are building karma. Now, the idea that karma or compensation is always evil is not true. We are building good just as much as anything else. The only reason the karma seems to be the more heavy on the negative side is as you look around you, you see the way people act. Conduct is the cause of that. Conduct and misuse, particularly conscious misuse, builds up the karma as retribution, as a correction, as unfoldment of internal potentials. Karma is a glorification of every good thing that we ever ever did, opening new doors to wonders yet to come. So we are in a little pattern that is rather simple, very honest doesn't require any forgiveness of this or forgetfulness of that, which cannot be cleared by any attitude. We can do anything we want to verbally, intellectually, or emotionally to correct the mistake. But if we do not correct the mistake itself, all our platitudes mean nothing. In nature, sin is not forgiven. It is outgrown. And there is no sin that cannot be outgrown. It's the most of our cases, the outgrowing is not very serious because the average individual does not commit great and serious wrongs. But these nagging uh, occurrences of the day will, should be taken into immediate consideration. If you wake up some morning and you find you have to have a bad temper, you can either face it now or later but you are going to face it. You are either going to correct that temperamental peculiarity or you are going to suffer the consequences. Now in the case of a bad temper, the consequences might start a little sooner. It might be the very day that you get angry. Negative consequences begin. You lose a friend or you make a serious mistake of some kind or you get yourself all worked up and have a terrible headache and to decide that the only cure for that sin is an aspirin tablet. <laughs> so you take the aspirin tablet, get a moment's peace, and have enough strength to be, get angry again. <laughs> and this goes on until the anger or the aspirin finishes you. <laughs> this is not the way that nature intended. Nature knows that everyone can make a mistake once. But having made it and knowing the consequences by experience should not repeat it. And unfortunately, humanity hasn't learned that very well. The first war was long ago. And then no one has apparently bothered to find out really how to cure it, to cure a war. The answer is don't cause it. There is no other way. They knew you cannot cure these things simply by trying to erase them or passing legislation against them. An individual who has a bad disposition gets sick and he goes to the doctor. The doctor gives him a pill which may make him sicker. He may get a little relief and he decides that medicine is the answer to sin, but it isn't. The actual answer is that the individual has no right to be healthy unless he tries sincerely to live a good life. All the different uh, temptations that we have in modern society uh, are not something that can be excused. We can say we have to be dishonest because everybody else is. That is simply saying I have to suffer because everybody else will suffer. There is no escaping on these bases. That's why a good working religion and a good working philosophy of life are so important. They give the individual an understanding of value. And they're not imaginary values because all he has to do is look around in society and he sees proof of all of it. He sees immediately that those who live by the sword will die by the sword. He can see immediately how injustice builds up into a great re revolution of some kind. He knows that the wrong thing cannot win. 
it can have a moment of apparent victory and then collapse. One nation after another has died of its own corruption. The same of races, the same of families, the same of individuals. Knowing this, this type of integrity, this basic sense of values, should be incorporated into our lives from the cradle on. We should be taught not to cure things or try to avoid them or evade them, but to live straight toward a constructive goal. If we need to know something, learn it properly. We have here the idea that learning is primarily a matter of preparing for a career of wealth. Now, wealth itself isn't bad. The career of wealth isn't bad. It is the abuse of the career or the abuse of the wealth. These are the bad things. And the, and the mysterious little factor in it that must not be overlooked is that wealth gives a larger opportunity to do it wrong. In other words, the temptation of wealth is more than the average person could stand anyway. But it only confronts those who have assumed that wealth was the source and cause and final of all success. The, the temptation is too great. Therefore, all things in moderation. As the Oracle of Delphi said, in all things, not too much. We must guard against the danger of our own weaknesses. We have to realize that we should only have what we can use wisely. We should only do what we can do lovingly and constructively. All the so-called faults and foibles that we nurse so carefully and have so much fun with do nothing but destroy us. So the cycle of life goes on. If you want the, to follow the idea of the old Christian reward and punishment, you can if you modify it somewhat. If you have a life in which you see and know that you're making a mess of things, then you must expect punishment. But it isn't punishment in the sense of a divine bookkeeper dealing out a sentence for your mistakes. The punishment is inherent in the mistake itself. When you do it wrong, pain is inevitable. If you think wrong, the thoughts are bound to be dangerous. If you are overambitious, you will struggle and finally be destroyed by your own ambitions. It isn't something else punishing you. Much of karma and much of the cycle of life can be seen here. That which is beyond being seen here is part of the larger cycle, the cycle in which the, the carry into the invisible uh, causes which cannot be corrected or are not corrected in the physical life. They have to be corrected. We have to learn from embodiment. And if we cannot learn while we're physically alive, we'll learn in the afterlife. We will learn the lesson regardless. There's no possible way of escaping it. But the nicest thing is to realize we can save ourselves a lot of trouble here and will refrain from hurting other people or as nations will not afflict other nations if immediately upon our inner understanding we begin to live according to what we claim to believe. Now, actually, there's nothing very secret about this. Actually, every major religion of the world has exactly the same teaching. They have it in a little different words, but the same teaching. In all cases, the golden rule is in over 40 different religions. The simple friendliness and kindliness of human relationships is applauded everywhere. There is no religion that actually requires or demands the individual to break the brotherhood of man. The religion does not do so. Some of its interpreters, for personal advantage, try to make it fit into their ambitions, but it doesn't. Actually, the uh, average person belonging to any one of the religions of the world, including the primitive, will find the same general rule applying. Do right and be right. Do wrong and be wrong. Do that which is good and grow. 
do that which is bad and penalize yourself. The uh, proof of all faith is in the practice thereof. And in our day, the interval between the faith and the practice is too great. It's more great than it ever was before because the temptations are greater. And we try to conceal the values by overlooking them or denying them. But the average person who is out making trouble for himself and others is someday going to face the tribunal. This tribunal is not a group of long-bearded judge, judges. This tribunal is that the individual has to ultimately face himself. And the longer he waits to do it, the more unpleasant that meeting is going to be. But we all have to come finally face to face with ourselves and realize that in ourselves we are the source of most of the sorrow that we suffer from. So this other way of, of the world it may be in dream and in vision. They may saw a beautiful world of light and color. Even in passing out, she says last words were, it is so beautiful. And in many cases, though, there are visions. And in some cases, someone like Andrew Jackson Davis could have a vision of an afterlife that is a beautiful valley with little farms and cottages and happy people. Those are symbols that rise in our own consciousness. But an afterlife that causes us fear, an afterlife that threatens us with damnation, is, not, is nothing. The threat is nothing. The individual breaks the rules just as he broke them before. You cannot frighten him into a state of grace very long. Occasionally, you can prevent a single incident. But for the most part, in his daily life, the individual will break any law of nature which bothers him, which forces him to change his ways. He will keep his ways and the laws will be broken. But sometime in the never-never land, he's going to have to face these laws. The universe is an immutable instrument created by an eternal reality. It is eternal in its scope and in its purpose. We must all go on and face the pattern of life for which our created universe was formed. We all have the same journey. We all have the same demands. We all have the same requirements in ourselves. We all have to be right. And there can never be peace in our heart, tranquility in our homes, or peace in the world until we are right. Until we are right, we will be nagged by our own infirmities. We can see this now politically, scientifically, economically. We have not yet, however, seen it in ourselves and realize that we are also an economic and a political entity. We have the same temptations that everything else has. If they are tempted and fall, we are tempted and fall. But it is possible because of the individuality which has been bestowed upon us, that man, of all creatures that, is visible, or that are visible to us, is capable of creating his own destiny. He is capable of being right. The animal cannot be wrong, and therefore belongs to an entirely ty different type of life. But the human being has the right to be right has the eternal power to do that which he should do, to keep the rules and to assist to build a civilization based upon these rules. He has a right to build a, a magnificent world and to cooperate with the divine power in the advancement of all living things. He has the right to work for principles and if he is properly rewarded, he is a true and faithful workman who is well worthy of his wages. But the, he is not, does not have the right to accumulate simply for the sake of accumulating or of exploiting somebody else. He has no right to accumulate what he cannot take with him. But while he is accumulating things that he wishes he could take with him, he loses them. And the power to accumulate, which was wrong, is the thing that goes on. 
It is not what he has, but the motives that made it get it made him get it that he must face in the ages to come. So it is much better for him to get ready for this at a reasonably early time and to see all these things through the light of inner understanding. There is nothing to fear in life except the tendency we have to compromise. If we can recover from that, we will have a much better world than we have now and we'll be able to look forward to a better one. And any little mistake that we can erase at this moment will not come up in the final examination. And it's much better for us to catch it now and have that little pleasant feeling that we have grown, that we have done something worthwhile. And by having this feeling, have the proper reward and, and respect for life. If we believe in God, we must believe that the divine power is worthy of our respect. We must also realize that it is worthy of our obedience. And as we look around us, we can see pretty clearly what disobeys and what obeys. That we cling to that which obeys and refrain from that which disobeys, it won't be long before this old world will look a lot better. And we will find that it is perfectly possible for our planet to go on for a long time and build up a population of 50 billion and everybody will be happy and everybody will eat regularly. It is selfishness, corruption on the belief that if we do these things badly, when we die, we, we do not exist. In order to be a truly successful rascal, you also have to be an atheist. You must have no belief, because if you have any belief worthwhile, you will not pervert it. You will live it. And by living it, will accomplish the good things that we are all seeking. Happiness, peace, contentment, strong families, happy children, busy adults, and no one wandering around the face of the earth trying to kill time for no good reason. There's always something good to do, something that needs doing. And by doing it, we build into the soul of the future. We are building the magnificent vestment of the soul. And we build it best, and we build it most beautifully and graciously through kindly living, loving friendship, and peaceful and honest relationships with each other. That's it. Thank you.